because your pastoral leadership feels like it's time for us to reboot as a church family. In the early part of the 20th century, there was a brave group of young men and women who became known as one-way missionaries. These folks were moved by the Holy Spirit to take the message of the gospel to some of the most isolated and dangerous people groups in the world. And to get there, they were going to have to go by ship. It was a task that was rife with danger, but these young folks had this fire burning within their souls that would not let them step away from what God had called them to do. Each of them purchased a one-way ticket to their destinations, and some of those destinations were places where the previous missionaries there had already been killed. These folks were so committed to being one-way missionaries that instead of using suitcases, in a symbolic gesture, they packed their belongings in wooden coffins. It symbolized the fact that they knew that they would never return. Yeah, I can imagine them as sailing out of port. They're waving goodbye to family and to friends and to the lifestyles that they'd enjoyed here in America. Everything that made them comfortable, they were just saying goodbye to it because they knew what they were going into and that they were never coming back. One of those missionaries was a guy named A.W. Milne. M-I-L-N-E, if you want to Google him. He was going to an island in the South Pacific known for its savagery. It was an island that was uh, inhabited by headhunters, cannibals. They had killed every missionary who had gone there before him. But William Milne was not really afraid of death because he was already dead. He had made a decision as a follower of Jesus to die to himself. And he had given himself wholeheartedly to Jesus. Heart, soul, mind, and body, everything about him belonged to Jesus. For Milne, his life was no longer about his comfort or his desires or his goals or his needs. His life was about obeying the Savior who had redeemed him and who had called him. Somehow, some way, God had made a way. <coughs> because Milne worked for 35 years among those people. <clears throat> he loved them, he learned their language, he learned their customs, his, his love was just pure and they somehow seemed to understand that and he led many of them to faith in Jesus. And when he died after being in that little small island country 35 years, <clears throat> members of the tribe where he died inscribed on a grave marker that they had for him when he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Now, th this is the life of a disciple. And the reason I'm going to go back over this again with you is because I have failed you. It would appear that over the last couple of years, I have failed to adequately articulate enough that this is the life of a disciple. We were not unlike so many new church starts. We actually really became more concerned about numbers and converts and we began to measure success by nickels and noses rather than by passion and impact on the world. 
And the amazing thing is that God blessed us greatly, not because of us, but in spite of us. But sitting in the mountains last Saturday with some quiet time, he called us to something deeper. Our vision is and will continue to be a safe place for people with doubts, questions, and issues. That has not changed. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, what your current lifestyle is. If you come in and sit at one of these tables, we are blessed to have you and you're going to be loved. But I have said before on a couple of occasions that true love is not going to allow you to remain the way you are. That's the way God loves. Our mission is and will continue to be to remove barriers and build bridges and share the love of Christ. It's a simple thing called relational evangelism. We, we are not going to be a people that take Bibles and slap folks around. We're going to love folks and along those relational lines build relations and be able to share Christ, earn the right to do that. And we're going to use similar methods to begin to make disciples. It's the method that Jesus used so effectively. It's called relational discipleship, and it involves small groups, kind of like 12 men. Did you ever wonder why Jesus didn't call a thousand disciples? Wouldn't his work have been more effective? No, he called 12, and even knew one of them was not going to follow through. And every one of them, even the one that was chosen to replace Judas, every one of them except John, lost their lives because of their faith. And I bet you didn't know this about John. You know why John was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he received the apocalypse and wrote the book of Revelation, singular? Because the Roman emperor at the time tried to kill him with burning oil, and it didn't work. And so he was exiled, scars and all. Your leaders in this church, and that's me, that's Joey, that's going to be rusty hopefully at some point if he'll just tell me. <laughs> Elders, we're going to be challenging you three or four times a year to get involved in a small group in order to grow your faith to the point that like these 12 men and like A.W. Milne, that faith begins to make an impact not only in your life, but in the life of others, because that's what Jesus called us to do. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, he gave which, what is perhaps the most clear, concise definition of a disciple that you can find. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Simon, who would become Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they're casting their nets, and they're trying to catch some fish, because that's what they did for a living. This was their comfort zone. They had family, they had friends, they had a business that they had been doing since they were children. They understood it. They were very comfortable, and Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Pretty simple, isn't it? By the way, did you know, how many times do you think the term Christian is used in the Bible? Just a thousand? Not quite. 
Anybody else want to call a gift? Three. The term Christian is used three times in the entire Bible, and usually it's in reference to an association with Jesus. You know how many times in its various, in, in its various forms disciple is used? Disciple, discipleship. <coughs> Bunches is right. It's not a thousand, but it's 270, and that's just the New Testament. So in 27 books, discipleship, disciple is used 270 times. So if that gives you any indication of where Jesus and the New Testament writers place their emphasis, then you understand God's not looking for Christians. He's looking for disciples. So what is a disciple based on this definition that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Here's the first thing. Disciples follow Jesus. Disciples follow Jesus. Mark Batterson, in his new book called All In, any of you watch world poker tournaments on TV? Go ahead and admit it. It's, it's church, but it's all right. There's one brave person then these people don't know what all in is, do they? When you watch these professional poker tournaments and somebody is pretty sure that they've got a winning hand, they'll take every chip they have and push it to the center of the table and say, I'm all in. In other words, this is win or lose, one way or the other. But I'm all in. Everything I have is gone to the center of the table, and I'm willing to risk it because of what I have in my hand. That's the way we're supposed to relate to Jesus if we're going to follow him. Now, in that book, All In, he writes of the selfishness of many professing Christians, and this is what that's about. Those, you know, there are those people who profess to seek God, but they seek him second or third or fifth or ninth in their lives. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things that you need will be provided for you. But what we have in the United States of America especially is men and women and young people who sit in churches Sunday after Sunday and they're just happy as they can be that they're going to heaven, yet they still place their own desires, their own needs, their own plans, their own concerns, and their own fears before everything else. And it's just a subtle form of selfishness, and you know what selfishness is? Three-letter word. S-I-N. Selfishness is sin. These are people that trust Jesus as their Savior because they don't want to end up in hell. Or they trust Jesus as their Savior because they've got some circumstance in their lives that's so heavy, they just want some relief from it, and they've tried everything else. So they say yes to Jesus as their Savior, but when it comes to living life day by day, moment by moment, basically what they're saying is, thank you for being in my life, Jesus. Now follow me and help me when I need it. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I've been there. Not anymore. But I have been there. And sooner or later, you learn that things really don't turn out so well when you're in charge. And God knows that. That's why Jesus said, follow me. And, and that's why we have to understand that the beginning of this relationship with Jesus, as, as much as we kind of, especially the more fundamentalists, want to shy away from this, the beginning of this relationship is an intellectual decision. 
We come into a church and we're sitting in a restaurant talking with somebody who's a friend and suddenly God appears. He, he's, he's around us. We, we sense him somehow, but we don't know him that well. We just know what this person is telling us. This person's standing on the stage or sitting across the table from us. But God's there and he's beginning to do something in our lives. <coughs> and we don't know him that well, but we just feel this sense that we have to respond to him. That's that intellectual decision that says, I don't know what all's going on, but I've got to do this. And we take that first baby step of faith that gets us into the kingdom of God. And if you follow through, will lead you into uncomfortable adventures for the rest of your life when you learn to trust and obey. I have the privilege of being friends on Facebook with a lot of young people. And some not so young. But there's a word that I see on Facebook quite often from some of these folks, and it's the word bored. Bored, hit me up. And then sometimes it's just bored, and they use all these uh, abbreviations, a bunch of consonants that I don't understand. Looks like a foreign language, you know? And what I've discovered is that when you go all in in your relationship with Jesus and you say, all right, I'm going to follow you instead of asking you to follow me, boring is one thing that you don't worry about. God did not call us to a boring life. God called us to an adventuresome faith where nothing is the same day to day, week to week, month to month. But we've got to be willing to die to self like Milne did and those disciples did and just get up and follow him with a whole heart. Okay? Now the second thing Jesus tells us about real disciples is that they are being transformed. You say, where does it say that? Take that five-word phrase, and I will make you. Uh, there is an Old Testament passage in Jeremiah, I believe it is, about his visit with a potter. Uh, a potter is someone that works with clay and uh, a wheel and a kiln, and that's how they would make the pottery. And in this, in this visit to the potter's house, God wanted him to understand what he did, what God does for us. He's, and he, what he learned was that the potter actually molds the, the, the pot or the dish or bowl or whatever it is. He molds it the way he wants it. And if at any point it's flawed, He crushes it and then begins to reshape it. You see, this is what makes American Christians uncomfortable. We want some kind of insurance plan against hell, but we don't want to go through the reshaping, remaking process that God wants to put us through to make us into what he wants us to be. but it's part and parcel of it. Follow me and I will make you. I will transform you. I will begin working on you. And when you put this with the uh, statement that he made to, to uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And it kind of makes it clear, right? Because when you take those first baby steps and you make that intellectual decision and you say, I think I might want to try this. I want to follow Jesus. Well, when you do that, you do not have all the answers. And what you discover is that no matter how old you get, no matter how far you go in the process, no matter how deep you go in your relationship with God, the moment you come to the place where you say, I've got it together, I know what it is, I've got the answers, that's when you're getting ready to get pruned, friends. 
You remember the sifting sermon, some of you, from a few months back? Sift happens. Yeah? Remember, that's what Peter did. He said, I don't care what these other guys do, but I will go to the death with you. And Jesus said, uh, wait just one second. Not going to happen, Bo. Listen, we all need folks to help us as we are born into the family of God. And at that point, the world kind of centers around us, right? You think about it this way. When you, this baby right here. If you're not wiping one end, you're wiping the other end, right? If you're not wiping the back end, you're wiping the front end. It just, it, and, and the world pretty much revolves around that baby. I mean, just like what you're doing there. He's hungry now, and it doesn't matter that we're in church. He wants it now, right? And that's okay when you're an infant. And that's okay when you're an infant in faith, when it's messy and it takes a little uh, uh, more involvement. But the fact of the matter is, when a person has been a Christian for years and they're still requiring that kind of treatment, something wrong. In fact, they haven't been remade because they haven't been following. It's like they're spiritual growth is stunted. And Jim Putman, who, who started Real Life Ministries out in Idaho, puts it this way. He said, you know, the reason there's so much conflict in churches today is because we have so many toddler and adolescent Christians who are in leadership roles. And guess what? If you go into a room of toddlers and you say, all right, all of you are in charge, guess what you're going to get? They're going to act like toddlers act instead of acting like mature adults. So there has to be a transformation. You know, once we've, once we've made, you need to understand from the moment we step into that faith in Jesus, we are constantly being changed by him unless we resist it. Once we've made the intellectual decision to follow him, that's when we have to then surrender our hearts to him. And that's the reason that Jesus spent three long years with these 12 men. I want you to understand, these were not spiritual giants. These guys were not spiritual giants. They were just regular guys with very little religious training, and they were dealing with the same kind of sinful struggles that we all face day in and day out. And they failed often, and quite often they did the same thing a second or a third time. Do you remember how often they used to fight about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? These were grown men. That's like a bunch of grown men fighting over how much they can bench press. Or whether Clemson or Carolina is the greatest. Have you ever seen people fight over that? I've been to a family reunion where my cousins fought over it. <coughs> Charleston Southern. <coughs> Excuse me. Charleston Southern. You know, these guys, I, I know that we've elevated them to this status of just being s something incredible, but the fact of the matter is, there was nothing, nothing special about these guys except that when Jesus said, follow me, they said, you bet. And if you look at that 20th verse, it says they put down their jobs and followed him. Jesus patiently worked to remake them and shape them and mold them and even right up to the crucifixion, he was still trying to deal with poor Peter. And then you know what? If you go over ten chapters into the book of Acts, he's still dealing with Peter when he's up on that rooftop taking a nap. Some people say he was meditating, but my guess is he was taking a nap. And he has this vision of this sheet that comes down and there are all kinds of creepy things in there that no human being should eat. 
But of course, in his religious training, he had been taught that you just don't eat these creepy crawly things and these things with split hooves. And the voice of God said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, Lord, I'll never eat anything unclean. And the voice of God said, don't call anything I'll make unclean. And he had the same vision three times the same afternoon he was up there. And then there was a knock on the door. And there were people who were not Jews who were there saying, we need to know about Jesus. Our boss wants to know about Jesus, a guy named Cornelius. Because you see, up until that time, Peter wouldn't have anything even to do with Gentiles telling them about Jesus. So, you know, months after Jesus is already ascending into heaven, he's still shaping and remaking Peter. It's, it's the same for all of us. If we follow, we have to understand that he's going to be about the business of breaking us and pruning us and shaping us so that we can bear the kind of fruit that he wants us to bear. Okay? Disciples follow Jesus, who will always be in the process of remaking and reshaping us, transforming. And by the way, notice this. Some people don't like change. But that's a transformation. And it occurs from the inside out. I could set this on top of the bottle, and it's not going to change it. I could set this under the bottle, not going to change it. Beside the bottle, not going to change it. And not until the stuff gets in there does it transform it. And the only way that we can be transformed is by the power of Jesus living in us. Okay? Now, here's the third part. Disciples build relationships to make other disciples. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers for people. And if you're a follower of Jesus, listen to this. Every follower of Jesus, every other follower of Jesus that you meet is someone that you can learn from or someone that you can teach. You know, iron sharpens iron, so the scriptures say. And in the same way, we are here to strengthen and to encourage one another to good works. Not to feel good, but to live a life of obedience and faith that brings glory to God. We've been given a job. We are saved for a purpose. We are to join our Lord on His mission to love, to reach, to teach a lost and hurting world and introduce them not only to Jesus, but also to stay with them until they learn how to live for Jesus. And the only way we can do that is if we embrace His mission and His passions and His priorities. And the only way we can do those things is to spend time with Him. Do you think that it was... Just a coincidence that Jesus chose these men and spent three long years with them? And yes, they weren't the most mature guys when he left them, but he spent those years dealing with their messes, investing his time and his love and his energy and his patience in them, helping to shape them for the task that he gave them. And you remember the task? We call, we call it the Great Commission. As he's getting ready to ascend into heaven and they're standing there, they said, you're gonna, this is when you're going to restore the kingdom of heaven to, to Israel, right? So that we'll be the big guys. <coughs> so they're still having some, well, how do I say that? Yeah, I was going to say bring something, but I, I can't do that up here. Uh, so they're still, something's not firing right. And he, he, he basically says, That's, it, it's none of your business. That's none of your business. This is what you need to be doing. As you go, 
you make Christians. Right? Really? Can anybody in here quote that verse? He said, as you go, you make disciples. Not converts, not Christians. As you go as a church, as you go as individuals, this is what you need to be worried about. Not when the world's going to end, not when the kingdom's going to be restored. You need to be about the business of going and making disciples. Baptize them. Teach them to do everything that I've commanded you. And just remember that I'm always with you. Right up until the end of the age, I'm there. The only way we can do that is to spend time with him. We're not in his physical presence like the disciples were, but we can still hear him through his word. We can still experience his power through the Holy Spirit. We can have a conversation with him through the privilege of prayer and the better we get to know him the more we understand that our mission is more than just coming to church and being nice and maybe a little behavior modification and giving some money and holding on to the status quo until Jesus comes again because his mission becomes ours and that is just to change the world one life at a time So, you a uh, Christian? You're a disciple. You're an unbeliever. Now, just so you understand, I got that other stuff on your line. Uh, just, just read those passages. Our purpose is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's our purpose for living. Once we say, I'm going to follow Jesus, then that verse says that he predestined us, not for salvation, but to be conformed to the image of his son. I have a friend named Ricky who often prays God... Help us to live so like Jesus that when you look down and see us, you mistake us for the man sitting at your right hand. Our purpose is also transformation. Those verses, Paul said, I, I, I beg you by the mercies of God to present your physical bodies as a living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable to God and that's your reasonable service of worship. But also, don't be conformed to the world around you, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove that which is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's an expectation from Jesus of transformation throughout our lives. And then our purpose is to live like him and for him. <coughs> Let me tell you something. And I know we talk some about judgment and grace here. We want to be just oozing grace all the time, and we do not want to be folks that stand in judgment of others. <coughs> but there's a difference between judgment and accountability. And when you become a follower of Jesus, you're accountable to each other. <coughs> And there will be people of faith that are more mature in the faith than you are. And at some point, there will be people in the faith that are not as mature as you are. And the fact of the matter is, we are accountable to one another as family. And when we see someone that we love and care about, headed in a direction that may be contrary to what Scripture teaches. Love requires that it be addressed. Love requires that it be addressed. 
And if you don't understand that, let me just ask you about your own family. Some of you have raised teenagers. Some of you are going to be raising teenagers one of these days. <coughs> and I can almost assure you that at some point, they're going to think they know better than you and more than you. And there's going to be a point when one of them is going to say something to you that kind of indicates that they think you're stupid or they think that you're wrong. And uh, you get to make a choice at that point. And let me tell you what the choice is. And this is not joking. You, at that point, you get to make the choice of whether you're going to be the parent or not. And, you know, occasionally, if you're, if you're genuine as a parent, occasionally you have to make decisions that make your children not like you for a while and just pray and hopefully at some point a light will turn on and they'll say that was the right thing to do. It comes with maturity. So... I, want you to, I, don't, I don't want you to, to misunderstand this, this concept of grace that I talk about and write about so much. It's there. It's there. But when you become a follower of Jesus, there are expectations. And those expectations are not my expectations or the expectations of Nova Church, or the expectations of the Southern Baptist, or the Catholics, or anybody else. Those expectations that we talk about are expectations of God, which are clearly lined out in the Scriptures. Okay? So, here's, here's what I want you to do. First of all, there are some of you here today that you need to, to give Jesus your head because that's where it starts. Some of you have been confronted by that today and you're thinking, yeah, well, this, this intellectual thing's going on in my head right now. I'm not sure if I want to do this or not because you're telling me that it can make my life uncomfortable and God could require me things that I don't want to do, blah, 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 but I still feel this need that I'm being pulled towards that. That's the Spirit of God working in your mind saying you need to take this first baby step and say yes I want to follow Jesus now you know th there's, a, there's a penitence prayer that's going around for centuries I guess or maybe it's just been in the last century there are no magic formulas but there has to be an attitude of repentance that's all so you simply speak to God in your heart, in your mind, however you want to do it, and say, God, I feel you're working in my life right now. I'm not sure what this is all about, but I, I think I want to know more. So right now is my mind the best that I can. I, I'm, I'm going to follow you. I want to know you. But there has to be some repentance. So do this. Acknowledge that you know that sin separates you from God. And then acknowledge that Jesus is the only one that can wash away that sin. And then follow. That's it. There are others of you here that need to give him your heart. Maybe you are among those who sit in church and, and are, are very active even, and maybe even go on mission trips and things like that, but you know. Nobody else may, but you know that when the rubber hits the road and you're out there at school or at work or wherever you are, you're not really thinking about living for Jesus. 
Oh, yeah. If somebody asked you, you'd say, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Ask Jesus in my life. But you know that there's been no transformation. That means it's time for you to give him your heart. It's time for you to say to him, you know what, I'm tired of living this way. I'm one way at church and another way when I'm not at the church. I'm one way around the people at the church, but when I'm not with people in the church, I'm another way. That's not the way it's supposed to be, and you're right, it's not. Because you're supposed to be submitting and allowing him to transform you from the inside out. It takes time. Look at, look at those guys, those disciples. But you've got to take the step and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you with all my heart so that you can begin to transform me from the inside out. And then there's some of you that may need to give him your hands and feet, which is just a symbolic of the fact that you... There's nothing in your life that demonstrates that you follow Jesus. You know, James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers. There are a lot of us that come in for a transfer of information every Sunday. We want to listen to our pastors and our Sunday school teachers. Give us information. That's not what the Scripture is about. The Scripture is about transformation. And transformation produces action. And there may be some of you sitting here who say, you know what? If I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart, I need to be doing more than just coming in here and sitting on Sunday morning for an hour and 15 minutes. And you're right, you do. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something in a minute <coughs> as we bring this to a close. But uh, I'm going to throw this out to you. And, and you guys, it, it doesn't apply to you here, but certainly it does where you come from. Uh, In August, we're going to start another round of small groups, okay? Here's what we need. We need people who are part of the Nova Nation that say, I want to be a part of a small group. We need people that are mature enough to lead it. We need people that may say, you know what, I don't want to lead one, but I'll let people come to my home, and I'll provide some refreshments so that we can have it in a home setting. But we need people that say, you know what, in order to provide more groups for people to build these relationships with one another and encourage one another as we walk in this faith, yeah, I'll do it. Why don't you see this guy back here named Jim Kaiser? Raise your hand, Jim. You see him after church. If you'd be willing to lead one, if you'd be willing to just offer your home as a meeting place for one, and if you're a leader, you can meet here, you can meet in your home, you can meet... Uh, in a restaurant, it doesn't matter. Now, there's going to be a little training that I'm going to do to make sure that we're all lined up properly about the expectations, but we need that. Second thing, we need for you to be in a group. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and bang a drum every day and say you've got to be in a group, but let me tell you something. You will not grow in your faith apart from your involvement with other people. The iron sharpens iron, and there are people that are sitting here that have been in a small group for two or three sessions, and they'll tell you how valuable it is. And these small groups are never going to get over 15, 18 people, because if they do, we're going to split them and start new groups because we want to keep the intimacy there, but you need to be in a group. If you're serious about transformation, if you're serious about being a disciple, you need to be in a group. So over the next few weeks, as we start to tell you about these new groups that are coming along, you need to choose one and get in it. And I'm going to make it easy for you. If you get into one and you say, oh, I'm not really interested in this study, then get out and get in another one. And the thing is, I'm going to be talking with these leaders, and we're going to try to have them all over the place at all different times so that nobody can say, well, there's not a group that meets at a time that's convenient for me. Because we want you to grow in your faith so that it not only impacts your life, but it impacts others.
Now, let's pray because I have some serious questions to ask a couple of folks. Will you give your life to Christ today? Intellectually, will you step up and say, you know what, I don't have all the answers and I don't know how this is going to work, but I do feel that urgency that I need this. So I will say today, I am going to try to follow Jesus. Can I see your hand? Just raise your hand right where you are. Thank you, young man. Thank you, young man. Thank you, brother. Got you. I want to follow Jesus with a whole heart. Lord, I pray for those folks that have done this today, that you would make your presence real in their lives. Uh, they're taking that baby step, and now they're uh, in an infancy state in their faith, but they are serious about it. These two young men, this young man over here, God, I pray that you would just bless them as they turn from their sins, as they turn to Jesus. God, I pray that you would begin to transform their lives in ways that they may not understand at first, but that they just trust you and obey you regardless of whether they understand or not. Fill their lives with adventure. In Jesus' name I pray. And for some of you, maybe it's a time of renewal or recommitment because you, you know that there was a time when you asked Jesus to come into your life, but you also know now that you haven't been transformed much because you've just been trying to keep that part of your life separate from the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. And maybe today the Spirit of God has said to you, no, it's time for you to quit being that safe Christian and get out and start being that dangerous disciple and let me just transform your life. It means you're going to have to spend more time with him. It means you need to get into the scriptures. Need you need to be involved in a prayer group. Need to be involved in a small group, life group, so that you can grow in your faith. Maybe there's some changes that need to be made in the way that you live your life. That's part of the transformation. If that's you, can I see your hand? I want to be a disciple starting today. That's me. I want to be a disciple. I don't just want to be a Christian. God, help those who right now in their hearts are saying to you, I want to be one of those disciples. Transform me, shape me, break me, whatever you need to do to make me the person you want me to be. God, do that great work in their lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we have together. Again, we thank you for this mission to serve uh, group that has come to serve the residents of Calton County. We pray for their safety, for, for good weather. We pray, God, that you would use them to make a difference for Christ in those neighborhoods and that you would help us as we serve them and help them, God, to just bring you glory in every way. Thank you for those who've made these commitments, decisions today. They're, they've taken a decision that's going to take them to greater heights in life than they ever dreamed possible, God, but do that great work. And when they get out there in the world this week, help them to bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. See you again soon.